Okay, um, so our next speaker is Casey Campbell. Casey is the managing director of North America at Gameloft. He started his career as in systems integration and, con and consulting, and then he moved to pursue his lifelong passion for video games and joined a mobile company in its infancy. Through 14 years of mobile gaming, he's navigated through massive upheavals in technology and business models, and I'm so thrilled that he's here. World Gaming, or sort of Gameloft, is one of the most downloadable mobile game publishers in the world. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So let's see if this works here. I'm going to start with a video. Okay, so this is Argentina versus France, uh, World Cup 2018. That's Antoine Griezmann. He shoots, he scores, and then he does a little bit of a celebration. I think you might recognize that as a dance for Fortnite. And the crowd sees the dance, and they replicate the dance. So uh, this, as I said, was a World Cup match. It was viewed by 301 million viewers worldwide. And uh, the internet lit up with the meme of Anton doing his Fortnite dance. And the reason I showed the video is to demonstrate the idea that uh, gaming is now a very, very powerful force in the world of pop culture. And it's really crossing boundaries and crossing borders and gives people now uh, a common language to speak about uh, entertainment. So um, uh, as Alex said, I've been in the industry for about 14 years. Um, the huge upheavals and uh, the evolution of the games industry, what it's, what it's become, what games now mean to people, it's, it's been fascinating. I thought I would just share a little bit about the games industry in general. Um, Esports is, is, as Wim said, a small slice of that, but I thought I'd give a, an indication of where the state of the industry is now, and then some of the larger potential for the future. So uh, gaming is actually a massive, massive business. And in fact, it's the biggest vertical in entertainment. So in 2018, uh, revenue from video games surpassed movies and um, music put together. So that gives you an indication of how popular it's, it's finally become. And um, really, uh, mobile gaming is set to surpass PC gaming and console gaming in 2019. So the growth rate is actually just really, really extreme right now. Um, mobile games and games in general are, are active consumption. So this isn't you passively consuming content. This is not uh, you know, the entertainment vehicle showing you a cool storyline or showing you, you know, a really cool action set piece. This is inviting the user in to participate and take part of that. And really, games give you a sense of emotional buy-in and passion that other forms of entertainment really have a difficult time competing with. Um, sorry, I'm trying to keep on schedule here and be fast. Uh, so we now have 2.2 billion gamers worldwide, and that's projected to reach 2.7 billion gamers uh, by 2021. Uh, so what this means is basically one out of three people on the planet will be playing games by 2021. And that's really remarkable if you think about that. That's not just the first world, that's the first world, the developing world. Uh, that's not only kids, but now it's also senior citizens. So you'll see the demographic split here shows, uh, and this is a tap choice study, by the way, but shows that 63% of gamers are now women. And also interesting is that the 50 plus demographic is playing more games than the 36 to 49 year olds. Um, so what this means, and I think we've all seen this, where you have a grandmother or a mom playing a game on the bus, um, you know, anybody with a mobile device and a few minutes to spare can actually become a gamer. And as Wim said, the stereotype of the kid sitting in his basement eating Cheetos, um, that's really not the case anymore. You know, really everybody's playing and it's, it's a massive shift and a massive business opportunity for those who are looking at connecting uh, to brands through gaming. So why do games resonate as well as they do? We know there's a little bit of brain science behind this, and I'll just go over it quickly. Um, we know that when someone's playing a game, uh, their brain is flooded with endorphins, so that creates focus. If you've ever tried to have a conversation with somebody uh, while they're playing a game, uh, you'll find it's very difficult, especially compared to talking to somebody who's passively watching television. Uh, we know that uh, video games engage the hippocampus, which drives recall, and we know that when they're playing, uh, games create oxytocin, which um, is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for creating social bonds and creating the feelings of trust and empathy within the user. And finally, when you get a virtual reward in the game or you have some sort of specific accomplishment, something special happens, uh, then your brain's flooded with dopamine. So that uh, creates a positive association. 
So really, um, when we see what's happening within the user's mind, we start to see why gamification as a business principle is actually catching on. And gamification is very simply applying the principles that make games fun and make them compelling and engaging to other business processes. So it's really uh, finding a way to reward the human predilection towards competition and accomplishment and then recognition for that. So uh, really, there's a lot going on here. Um, sorry, excuse me. When you look at games and gamification, it's not just entertainment, but really a framework, a mechanism of motivation and rewards. And then when you look at the critical mass of people who are now playing games worldwide and who now understand that terminology and understand that language of playing, it really opens up tremendous possibilities and tremendous opportunities to do good. Um, so for example, we've worked on a project that was a touch-sensitive simulation game that was created to, um, to teach doctors how to perform biopsies properly. And there's a game that was sponsored by Disney called Monster Guard and it was created to teach kids about disaster preparedness and emergency preparedness in case of natural disasters. And this is one of my favorite examples of applying gaming principles for a bigger cause. So this was a game called Sea Hero Quest. Um, really fun game, uh, you sort of pilot a little boat around through channels and seas and you're trying to find your way to these little waypoints. And along the way you take photographs of sea monsters. So there's actually a lot going on under the hood of this game while you're playing it's, uh, it's scoring you and it's uh, measuring your spatial navigational skills. And spatial navigational skills are the first things to go uh, with the onset of dementia, or among, among the first skills to go with the onset of dementia. So this game was actually created by a team of cognitive scientists so that they could uh, gather data worldwide and baseline human spatial navigational skills, okay? So really, while you're playing this game, you're contributing to their research. And they're finding some really interesting things when they're looking at this research as it goes across demographics and across geographies. Uh, one of the things that they're finding is that um, these skills start to deteriorate at around age 19, which is much, much younger than they originally anticipated. Uh, they're finding that men and women consistently take different paths to find the waypoints, to find the checkpoints, which is very strange. And they also found that people in Nordic countries are much better at playing this game than people from non-Nordic countries, which, again, deserves you know, further, further investigation. Um, so the value of the data set that's being generated by this game in particular is absolutely incredible. Um, before Sea Hero Quest, the largest group that ever participated in a study of spatial navigation uh, was 599 people. Now, this game was downloaded and played by over 3 million people worldwide. So now, these researchers have this massive, incredible worldwide data set that they can use to study dementia. So I just wanted to use this example, just talk a little bit about how the audience has spread, and now you have all these people that understand the language of gaming and have bought into this as a, as a concept. And really, games have evolved to the point where they're a way for people to connect across borders, to speak a common language, and to understand, uh, understand each other better. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for, yeah, sure. Hello, my name is Harun. My question is, how will uh, mobile gaming impact tournaments? Ah, so actually, I work for Gameloft, and we're sort of dipping our, our feet into tournaments and into the esports space. Uh, we're starting the third season of ESL Mobile Open, and mobile gaming is actually a really nice fit with esports because it's so accessible, right? So I think one of the challenges with esports is if you see like a Dota, it's, it's a little difficult for a casual observer to look at everything that's going on the screen and understand what's happening whereas mobile games tend to be a little bit more casual, a little bit more accessible. Uh, we actually had a funny story from a couple of weeks ago, the ESL uh, Mobile Open Season 2 Finals were in New York, and there's a guy named Elite Joe. And this is just a guy out of nowhere. I mean, this guy literally had been playing games on his mom's couch on his phone a couple weeks earlier, and he emerged as the Asphalt 9 champion through the ESL Mobile Open, totally out of nowhere. And, and that's what I think is the benefit of, of mobile games, when it comes to, sorry, when it comes to tournaments. Um, Gameloft was actually the first mobile games company to implement uh, Twitch's SDK in their game. So we were the first mobile games company to have the Twitch button. 
Sure. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Uh, I had a quick uh, question as as far as the data sets for gamers, and you said it was going to grow to I think 2.9 billion by uh, 2021. How are you defining what a gamer is, or how long are they actually playing games? Sure, so that was from a Tabjoy study, and their definition was uh, somebody that played games uh, six times or more during a week. So it, it's not, I mean, it's not like one of these spoofed views, it's actually a real, uh, a real stat. Now something interesting when we're talking about the audience and how the audience is evolving is that, uh, another stat for you, but 68% of those people didn't really self-identify as a gamer. So as Wim was saying, um, you know, there's a stereotype that exists about the kid in the basement eating the Cheetos. You know, the stereotype still exists, but really the audience looks nothing like that any longer. Okay. Can I take one more question? <clears throat> so you're working at a developer uh, game loft. Um, <clears throat> my question is, where we're seeing with EA and a lot of other developers and production companies are really getting hit hard by uh, people saying that their microtransactions, their loot boxes are should be considered gambling. Uh, how is GameLoft and the game industry adapting to potential regulations where they will say it's gambling, you can't have them offered to kids, which is, I mean, EA made $2.78 billion from uh, microtransactions alone, which a lot was yeah. loot boxes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, to be perfectly honest, we have loot boxes, we call them gacha, gacha mechanic. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this kind of is a throwback to the old school uh, baseball cards, where you buy a pack of baseball cards, some you're gonna want, some you're not gonna want, you go and buy more baseball cards. But understanding that the regulation is, is sort of moving in a certain direction, um, we see Apple Arcade, uh, which is an offer that's now live, well there's, there's no microtransactions at all, it's basically a one subscription deal, and you pay this way. Um, I think we're talking to wireless carriers around the world who are looking at getting back into um, back into the gaming business and streaming on 5G. And again, that's probably going to be subscription based versus microtransaction based. So the interesting thing about mobile games is um, I've been with GameLoft for 12 years. My job changes like every three years, so it doesn't feel like it's been a long time. The industry is constantly, constantly evolving. Um, this is just going to be one more stage in the evolution, but uh, Apple's already thrown their hat in the ring with the all-you-can-eat subscription service. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you very much. So, for those of you that are new,